So now it's time to start writing some formulas. Remember those charges from earlier? Here's where you're going to need them. Make sure you've got these written down and nearby so they're ready to use while you're watching this video. Writing chemical formulas for Category 1 compounds is a two-step process. First, we write the symbol for each element just like they are found on the periodic table. And then second, we need to use those charges we just mentioned to determine what the subscripts for each element will be. Quick reminder, charges come from the periodic table. Subscripts are those little numbers after each element in the chemical formulas. Charges, subscripts. Charges, subscripts. Get the picture? All right. Let's try an example to see how these charges are actually going to work. Here is a familiar compound, sodium chloride. Some of you might recognize that name. It's salt. Regular, old, everyday table salt. We use it to flavor our foods, to keep our roads from freezing over in the winter, and we taste it every time we go to the beach. Salt is an important mineral in our everyday lives, but to scientists, it's called sodium chloride. This is another example of those common substances that have a very different chemical name according to the IUPAC rules. So let's figure out what salt's actual chemical formula is. According to step one, we need to write the symbols for the two elements. So for sodium, that's Na, and for chloride, that's telling us chlorine, so we're going to use Cl. Now we get to the tricky part. We need to use the charges for sodium and chlorine to determine what their subscripts are going to be. So we go to the periodic table and we find our two elements. Sodium is a blue element in column 1A. It has a charge of positive 1. And then chlorine is a nonmetal in column 7A. It's a halogen. So chlorine gets a charge of negative 1. So we take those charges back to our example and add them in as superscripts. Okay, what does that mean? Superscripts. That means we write them in as little numbers above the symbols. Okay, so sodium has a charge of positive 1, so we write it as a plus 1 above the Na. And then chlorine has a negative 1, so Cl gets a minus 1 superscript. All right, well, now that we have charges for each element, what are we supposed to do with them? In order to determine our subscripts, we have to make sure that the charges equal out. That means we have to make sure they add up to zero. Okay, well, let's see if this works here. Positive 1 plus negative 1 equals zero. Oh, so it works. The charges equal out. So that means that sodium chloride is an easy formula to write. We don't need any subscripts to make the charges add up to zero. To finish off this formula, we simply write the symbol for sodium, Na, and the symbol for chlorine, Cl, next to each other as one formula. So NaCl is our final answer. This is the correct chemical formula for sodium chloride. Okay, now that was a pretty simple example. Let's try one where we actually do need some subscripts in order to make our charges equal out. Let's try magnesium fluoride. As always, we just follow the steps. Step 1. Write the symbols for each element from the periodic table. Mg for magnesium and F for fluorine or fluoride here. Step 2. Let's check out those charges. Magnesium has a positive 2 charge and fluorine has a negative 1 charge. Does anybody see the problem already? We can already see that these two charges don't equal out to zero. We're going to need some subscripts. So we plug in those charges as superscripts above the symbols just to make sure we can see all of our work. And we ask ourselves the important question, do the charges equal out? Well, since positive 2 plus negative 1 equals positive 1, they definitely do not add up to equal 0. So no, the charges do not equal out. And we're going to need to add some subscripts to our formula in order to make the two elements work. Good news. You have some options for how to do this part. There are two strategies that students can use to determine the subscripts. I'll warn you ahead of time, the first is a little complicated and it uses a lot of math, but it always works every single time. The second is simpler and maybe a little easier to understand, but it has some problems that you have to watch out for. 
Choose whichever strategy you want, but watch out for those warnings. Here's the first method. I call this AX plus BY equals zero. We start with an equation, AX plus BY equals zero. And each letter stands for something we either know already or something that we need to know. The first part is all about the metal. A stands for the metal element subscript, and X stands for the metal element's charge. The second part of the equation is all about the nonmetal. B stands for the nonmetal element subscript, and Y stands for the nonmetal element's charge. We need all four of these pieces of information in order to write the chemical formula. If you use this equation correctly, you can always solve for whichever pieces of information you're missing. And you have to make sure that all the pieces multiply and add up to zero. So let's put this into action. The pieces we do not know are the two subscripts. That's what we're trying to determine. The pieces we do know are the two charges. We can plug those in right away from the periodic table. All right, the charge on magnesium is positive two and the charge on fluorine is negative one. But where do we go from here? All right, here's an important hint. Find the LCM. Remember that from your algebra classes? LCM stands for least common multiple. If you need help on how to determine the LCM of two numbers, see your teacher during review time or go look up a tutorial online. To help us determine the subscripts, we need to find the LCM of the two elements charges. So we need to find the LCM here of two and one. Don't worry about the positive and negative signs, just focus on the number values. The LCM of 2 and 1 is 2. So that means we need the first part of the equation, the A times X part, to equal positive 2. And we need the second part of the equation, the B times Y part, to equal negative 2. That way they both equal each other out and they add up to 0. Hmm, alright. Well, what number times 2 gives us 2? Oh, it has to be 1. So A must equal 1. Okay, well, what number times 1 will give us 2? It has to be 2. So B must equal 2. Wow, so there it is. Using the AX plus BY equation, we determined that the subscript for the metal, that's what A stands for, needs to be 1, and the subscript for the nonmetal, that's what B stands for, needs to be 2. So we add those subscripts to our symbols. We get mg1 and then f2. But since we don't actually write the ones in chemical formulas, our final formula is mgf2. All right, so that's the AX plus BY method. It may seem complicated, but I guarantee you it always works. If that method isn't clicking for you, let me show you one more option for determining subscripts. I think you'll like this one. This is called the crisscross method. You see our charges up there? Positive 2 for magnesium and negative 1 for fluorine? In the crisscross method, all you need to do is crisscross those two charges and then turn them into subscripts. Here's what I mean. We pull the 2 from magnesium down and give it to fluorine. And we pull the 1 from fluorine down and give it to magnesium. So we end up with Mg1 and F2. Pretty simple, right? Just remember, when you crisscross the charges, you ignore the positive and negative signs. Once you pull the numbers down, they aren't charges anymore. They are subscripts, and subscripts and charges are very different. So keep it clean. Ignore the sign. So again, we find out that the correct chemical formula is MgF2. So I'm guessing you think that's pretty clear and simple. And I'm guessing you think it's a lot easier. But I have a warning for you. It doesn't always work. The crisscross method might seem like less work than our other method, but you have to be very careful when you use it. Here are some rules to follow to make sure you crisscross the right way. First of all, as I've been saying, subscripts and charges are different. Remember that charges tell us about how the element behaves and interacts with other elements. We write charges at the top of the element as a superscript. Subscripts are very different. They tell us how many atoms of each element are present in one particle of the substance. We always write subscripts at the bottom of the element symbol. Charges have signs, positive or negative. 
Subscripts never have signs. They are always positive whole numbers, like one, two, or three. Make sure you don't mix up the two. Subscripts are the only numbers that get to show up in the final chemical formula. There are never any charges in a chemical formula. Once you crisscross, it's no longer a charge. It's now a subscript. Charges and subscripts are different. Different things, different meanings. Get the point? All right, here's my second warning for you. Many times when you crisscross, you will have subscripts that can be reduced down to a simpler ratio, kind of like a fraction. If the subscripts can be reduced, you have to reduce them as far as possible. Subscripts need to be the simplest ratio you can make them. Here's an example of how this happens. If your metal element, that's the M here, has a charge of positive 4, and your nonmetal element, that's the NM here, has a charge of negative 2, the crisscross method is going to give you M2NM4. Looks good enough, but it's wrong. 2 and 4 can be reduced down, so you have to simplify them. When you reduce 2 and 4, they become 1 and 2. So the correct subscripts are 1 for M and 2 for NM. That means the correct formula is MNM2. If you don't reduce, it's wrong, period. So don't forget to simplify your subscripts. Get the point? The crisscross, me the crisscross method is easy to learn, but you have to pay close attention to what you're doing. Watch out for these two warnings, and you shouldn't have any problems. Remember that example we were working on? Here's our final answer, MGF2. It doesn't matter which method you choose, if you do it correctly, you should always end up with the right formula. My suggestion, use both options. The best way to make sure you've got your formulas right is to check your work. Try using AX plus BY to write your formulas and then check your work with the crisscross method. That way you have two different strategies to compare and you can make sure you're always getting the right answer. All right, guess what time it is. Let's try this out on your own. Here are three examples of category two compounds. Use their names to write the correct chemical formula for each substance. Pause the video and give yourself some time to work these out. Then press play to see the answer. I'll actually tell you how to find the correct answers this time too, since it might help some of your questions. You can even try one at a time, check your answer, and then move on to the next. Go ahead, give them a try. All right, here's your answers. Check your work and see if you still have any questions. You can ask your teacher for more help, or you can go back in the video and review some. I'm going to go through how to find each of these answers now. Make sure you pay attention and jot down any questions you have so that you can find the answers later. Let's start with strontium oxide. You start off by writing the symbols for both of those elements. So SR for strontium and oxide would come from oxygen, so that's O. Then you need to check your charges to make sure that you don't need any subscripts. Well, strontium always has a charge of plus 2 and oxygen always has a charge of negative 2. So that means they automatically cancel each other out. They automatically equal zero. You don't need any subscripts. That one's pretty simple. Let's try rubidium nitride now. You start again by writing the symbols. You start with RB and N, and their charges are positive 1 and negative 3. Then we need to plug that into AX plus BY equals zero because the positive 1 and the negative 3 don't automatically balance each other out. So we need to find the LCM of 1 and 3. The LCM is going to be 3, so we need to find a way to make A times plus 1 equal 3. Well, A times 1 is 3, so A must need to be 3. All right, well, let's look at the numbers for nitrogen. Nitrogen's charge is negative 3, and we need a number to make it equal 3. So what times 3 equals 3? Well, it's got to be 1. So A has to be equal to 3 and B has to be equal to 1. So that means our final formula would be RB3N1. And since we don't write the 1s, it's just RB3N. There's rubidium nitride. Let's try barium phosphide now. You start off by writing the elements and their charges. BA has a plus 2 charge, and P has a minus 3 charge. Well, they don't balance out, so we need to get out AX plus BY. We plug in the two charges, and then we figure out what the LCM is. 
the least common multiple of 2 and 3 is going to be 6. So we need the blue part to equal 6, and we need the red part to equal 6. Well, 3 times 2 equals 6, so A must be equal to 3. And 2 times 3 equals 6, so B must be equal to 2. So that means A is going to equal 3, and B is going to equal 2. So our subscripts need to be BA3P2, and that's our final equation. How was that? You're still having problems? It's okay if you are. Ask your teacher if you have some specific questions, or go back and work through some of the earlier parts of this video. Pause and rewind as much as you need, then move on when you've got it. Remember guys, practice, practice, practice. Have fun!